Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. And welcome to um, this event that Achieve is uh, proud and pleased to sponsor. It's called Developing and Discovering Quality Curriculum in a Google World. Or in other words, how do we find high quality curriculum and instructional materials, right? And how do we help people find it? Um, you know, think about it. The quality of curriculum and instructional materials, right, it's central to education reform central to improving achievement, central to closing achievement gaps. It has been a main tenant, if you will, a main principle of the idea of standards-based reform oh, going back to the 1990s, right, long before standards were cool, and then they stopped being cool for a while. Um, right. It's, you know, it's getting curriculum and instructional aligned to standards has been what a lot of us have been working on for a long time. But it's received a lot less attention than some other, say, sexier topics like testing or accountability or teacher evaluation, which are both sexy and controversial, let's admit. Right? But for much of the time, curriculum and instruction has been seen largely as a local control issue. I know when the Common Core got started, and even in the decade before that, when states were adopting standards, right, they were responsible for standards, responsible for assessments, responsible for accountability, and would not dream of interfering in local control decisions about curriculum. And they probably didn't have much capacity to do it anyway. But I think with the advent of the Common Core, we've increasingly come to recognize that getting that piece of this puzzle right is absolutely essential to success. It's absolutely essential to teachers being able to implement the standards well and students being able to learn what we expect of them. But if you look around right now, it's pretty clear that lack of well-aligned instructional materials has really hampered the implementation of Common Core standards since the outset. I will tell you, Achieve started paying some attention to this issue in 2000 and 10, we were asked by the uh, commissioners then in New York, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts to help them coordinate their investments in curriculum aligned to the Common Core. They had race to the top money. Turned out getting states to coordinate investments in instructional materials was challenging. But we were able to help them figure out how to evaluate whether the investments they made actually delivered the curriculum and instructional materials that they wanted. We created a tool since called Equip, right, that is used to evaluate the alignment and quality of instructional materials of lessons and student work assignments and the like. Uh, but we took a year to develop that, and it took another two years before working with those three states and about 20 others took another two years before we could post the first exemplary set of materials on our website, right? Because we couldn't find really good stuff for a long time. So that sensitized us to just how big an issue and how challenging this is. In, I think, 2014, 14 Fordham released a series of case studies of local district implementation of the Common Core in a handful of states. And one of the major findings was districts were struggling struggling to find good materials. Uh, Ed Reports was founded in 2014 in part to help address this issue. In 2015, they put out their first review of uh, uh, math textbook series, and they found only one K-8 series that was well aligned to the Common Core at all grade levels. Out of 87 individual textbooks that they looked at, um, they found only 31 that met their criteria for alignment, another signal Right, that we have big gap between what we needed and what we had. Uh, the Center for Education Policies uh, did a survey recently. 45% of the districts they surveyed reported major problems finding aligned textbooks. 45% reported minor problems finding aligned textbooks, which means there are only 10% that either had no problem at all or had a problem that was even bigger than a major problem. And I suspect it was probably more the latter than the, the former. A study in California that Ed Source did recently found that out of four or six districts that they tracked, finding high-quality instructional material was a major problem. I could go on, but the point is, uh, it's a problem, right? This is an issue that we need to, to address. And it's important because we've had some studies that remind us that instructional materials actually matter, right? 
they're not the only thing that matters. High quality teachers, high quality instruction clearly matters. Right, but so does having high quality instructional materials. Tom Kane at Harvard recently reported on a study. He surveyed teachers and principals in five states. He asked a lot of questions about instructional practices and strategies, including but not limited to the textbooks that were being used. He also was able to get the results of the 2015 administration of either Park or Smarter Balanced in those states, right? So we had the ability to at least get a cut at the impact of instructional materials, controlling for lots of other things, on achievement. And he found that at least in fourth and fifth grade math, the quality of the instructional materials, that is the difference between taking things that have been, been evaluated as being high quality versus not, had only a slightly smaller impact on achievement than a big experiment that was done in Tennessee in the 80s, their STAR program, their class size reduction program, had almost as big an impact on achievement uh, gains as did the uh, reduction in class size from 23 kids to 16 kids, except it's a whole lot cheaper to improve the quality of instructional materials than it is to lower class size. A report put out last fall by um, uh, CAP for the Center for American Progress, uh, they too found that curriculum and instructional materials have the potential for a huge return on investment. A huge return on investment, again, at a much lower cost than most other strategies that we, um, uh, that we spend an awful lot of time working on and worrying about. So this is a really important issue, uh, big challenges. One of the challenges is that the marketplace for instructional materials is changing pretty dramatically as well. It is, first of all, far less top-down than it used to be. There are maybe 15 to 20 states that are textbook adoption states. California is the, you know, exhibit A for that. If you could get California, not to mention Texas and Florida, but if you can get California to make uh, a decision about textbook adoption, right, that had a powerful impact. That was true. California has now moved to a local control state. They still identify uh, materials that they regard as high quality. It's not clear it's the most selective view of quality of any place in the country. But they identify them, and then local districts are free to use whatever they want. So textbook adoption at the state level uh, doesn't necessarily mean what it used to mean. Often individual schools deal directly with test, uh, textbook publishers and their sales force, and they purchase materials regardless of what the state says and what the district says. Teachers have easy access to materials online. They can search all over the place. Google is just one example. But they also can find, you know, Achieve the Core, Engage New York, etc. There's lots of places that teachers can search without having to go through any formal review process, any hierarchy or anything like that. There's growing move to digital materials, which will, I think, exacerbate or accelerate that trend. Right? And a lot of it could be quite good, but the ability to get a coherent curriculum in the classroom right, is a whole lot harder when you've got individual teachers who often lack both the time and the capacity to evaluate everything that's out there and make good calls. When they often lack that, the odds of getting a coherent curriculum in the classroom, I think, go down, and that's not good for, for kids. Now, there are some very promising sources and very promising lessons that we've learned right, about how to, how to find the best that's out there and how to improve the situation, how to, how to stimulate smarter demand, if you will, and, and, and uh, help create more discerning consumers. And maybe we're learning something about how to stimulate a smarter supply on the, on the uh, publisher side. To help us learn more about this, we have a great panel here this afternoon. And I'm going to take a moment to introduce them, and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, my colleague Sandy Boyd, who is going to moderate the panel. Uh, but let me just tell you what the lineup is here. So first of all, Sandy is um, the C COO of Achieve. Many of you know her for her sterling uh, political savvy and her policy expertise. Um, uh, uh, she has done a lot to help uh, uh, defend the standards and help support those who are defending the standards in states. She also is the person who makes Achieve run and work. Uh, I just get to sit here and look good, or at least sound good. Um, and Sandy makes, makes everything uh, happen. 
to my left is John White, who's the state superintendent of education in Louisiana. He's been there since January of 2012. Uh, under his leadership, uh, Louisiana's high school graduation rate has risen by six points. There are roughly 6,300 more graduates that are annually ready for college now than was the case before he started. Uh, Louisiana is, is now the nation's fastest improving state on AP tests and on a variety of other uh, metrics of performance. Louisiana is clearly uh, on the rise. Uh, there's a lot more I could tell you about John. I think what is most important and what I have come to appreciate the most is in a state that probably faced the toughest political battles around standards, John didn't blink, John didn't flinch, John stood firm and was successful. And as a result, Louisiana kids will benefit from the high expectations that they and everybody else in the country deserve. So John, I'm particularly pleased that you're here with us today. To John's left is Ashley Bessex, the manager of literacy professional learning in the District of Columbia Public Schools. She's newly selected as the manager of literacy professional learning. Um, after she earned her undergraduate degree in English at the University of Buffalo, she moved to DC. She took on an assignment uh, at the uh, Phelps Architecture Construction and Engineering High School. Right, and over the last eight years, she's taught a variety of courses and has now taken on a leadership role in improving curriculum in the DC public schools. And to her left, and who will be our leadoff speaker, is Julia Kaufman, who's a policy researcher at the RAND Corporation. Her primary areas of interest at RAND include the measurement of teacher instruction and how policies and programs can support high quality teaching and, and, and learning uh, in, the, in the classroom. She has uh, been conducting a variety of studies in that space, particularly around the implementation of the Common Core, and particularly uh, uh, with a panel of teachers that are surveyed periodically by RAND, and we're gonna hear more about that in just a moment. So without further ado, Sandy, and then to Julia. I think actually I'm turning it over to Julia to start Julia? us off. Okay. It's all yours, thank you. <laughs> all right, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm just gonna be giving you an overview of instructional materials, and that's part of an April report that we released that looked not only at instructional materials, but also at teachers' practices and teachers' knowledge about um, Common Core state standards. But today, I'm just gonna be focusing on instructional materials. Um, so we have a little qualifier at the bottom of the slide. You, you're welcome to tweet about these findings. They've been pretty rigorously peer reviewed. But towards the end of the um, presentation, we're gonna be talking about some Louisiana specific findings just because we have John here and didn't wanna miss that opportunity. And if you want to dig deeper on those findings in, in a um, article or, or write a report on it, just um, if you could touch base with me, that would be great. So as Mike said, you know, I think we, we approached this study with the idea that teachers cannot help students meet their state standards to the best capacity if they don't have access to high quality standards aligned instructional materials. And we don't know that much about what materials are aligned with the Common Core state standards. There are some reviews, um, Ed Reports has done some reviews. Um, there have been some journal articles on the topic. Um, Ed Reports, for example, found that Eureka Math, which is part of Engage New York, is really pretty well aligned with the Common Core. But there are really only a handful of other materials that they found to be aligned. Um, for English language arts, we know much less. And one of the big questions that we have about English language arts is that the Common Core focuses a lot on complex texts and teaching grade level texts. And Common Core, however, is silent on the use of leveled readers and how much teachers should be using leveled readers. We find in our survey, and you'll see these findings in a moment, that teachers do use leveled readers a lot, and the question is how they're using them and whether that's well aligned with the Common Core and hopefully we'll have a little discussion on that. Um, places like Louisiana have done some rigorous reviews of instructional materials and made those reviews available online um, as a resource to their teachers, but not all states do this and to varying degrees. So um, these findings are drawn from the American Teacher Panel, as Mike mentioned. This is a um, longitudinal panel of teachers who have graciously agreed to be periodically surveyed on um, various education and policy issues. Now, 
these teachers um, are surveyed maybe three or four or five times a year now, and the, the survey is becoming more popular. And response rates are around 50, 60 percent, which is a little lower than we'd like. We do use a model of what we call non-response to try to upweight the teachers that didn't respond as much from different subgroups and downweight those that responded, that responded more to the survey. So we attempt to uh, you know, ameliorate any biases, but the response rate is something that we're working to improve. Now, we have responses from teachers in four target states also. So we have oversamples in four states, California, Louisiana, New Mexico, and New York. And today, I'm just going to be talking about the Louisiana-specific findings and comparing them to the national averages. So the findings that I'm going to be presenting just focus on responses from teachers in those 42 states that have adopted the Common Core or standards similar to the Common Core. And in this report, we call them SAC states, which is another acronym for you. And those are states that have adopted standards adapted from the Common Core or similar to the Common Core. So we call all 42 states SAC states in this analysis. Um, and we're going to be talking about four different questions that we're going to try to look at through our survey data today. One is what factors influence math and ELA teachers' use of instructional materials? What do they say influences what they use? Um, and then what are the most common materials that teachers are drawing on online and published in math and ELA? Um, what opportunities do teachers say that their main materials give them to address various aspects of the standards? And then lastly, I'm just going to be sharing a little bit of Louisiana um, findings from Louisiana teachers compared to um, the rest of the SAC states. So first, some of the reasons why teachers say that they use um, instructional materials. We asked teachers a range of questions about each of their main materials. So for their top three published materials, we asked them, what, to what extent do these various factors influence your use of those materials? And we compared students, I mean, I'm sorry, we compared teachers at the elementary level to the secondary level. We compared teachers across states. And the most compelling differences were between ELA teachers and math teachers. It looks like ELA teachers say that they're influenced a little bit differently than math teachers are in their use of instructional materials. English language arts teachers, for example, generally say a lot of different things influence their use of instruction materials. About half of ELA teachers say, yes, standards influence my use of materials. Yes, district guidelines influence my use of materials. Yes, quality of materials does. But math teachers in particular were more likely to say that district guidelines as well as state standards influence their use of materials. And they were less likely to say that the quality of materials, students' interest, um, assessment results, special needs influence their use of instructional materials. And these are really the top influences. There, there are some influences that didn't make the cut, and so they aren't on this chart. Um, things like professional development didn't make the cut. Teachers didn't, a lot of teachers didn't say that that influenced their use of materials. Um, additionally, pre-service. That was lower on the scale. Re on a related note, we also asked teachers the extent to which their district recommends or requires their use of instructional materials. And we found some, uh, some similar themes in that math teachers, in particular at the elementary level, were more likely to say that their district requires use of their main instructional materials. So 62% say that their district requires use of their main instructional materials. Only 15% say that they don't get district recommendations or requirements. Now for English language arts, by contrast, especially at the secondary level, a full, almost a third of English language arts teachers at the secondary level say that their district neither requires or recommends their main instru instructional materials. So what they do, we're not sure. They probably do a lot of work to put together their instructional materials on their own. We didn't see any free differences between teachers in lower and higher free and reduced life crunch price lunch schools. So teachers in lower and higher poverty schools didn't differ in the extent to which their district requires curriculum, according to our analysis. So now the next question is what materials teachers tend to report that they use the most. I'm going to start with online materials. Um, perhaps unsurprisingly, most all teachers use Google. 
Um, in addition, they say that they use Pinterest, teachers pay teachers, um, their State Department of Education website, among various other resources. Now, in this chart that I'm showing you, we're, tr we're comparing teachers in higher poverty schools, so teachers in schools with 75% or more free and reduced lunch price students, compared to those in lower poverty schools. And what we see in this chart is that the teachers in the higher poverty schools report um, seeking out almost all of these resources in greater percentages. Pinterest, Teachers Pay Teachers, um, Teaching Channel, but also things like Core Standards, which is pretty well aligned with the standards, and Learn Zillion, which is purported to be pretty aligned with the standards too. So they seem to be seeking out standards aligned resources as well as these other resources in greater numbers. Now, you know, Teachers Pay Teachers, Pinterest, these are, these are resources that probably have some great lesson tasks that are wonderfully aligned with standards and some that aren't. And so this suggests that teachers in higher poverty schools could be using a wide array of resources and of varying quality and perhaps need those resources more than other teachers. Um, now for mathematics. Now, mathematics teachers most commonly reported that first, they either develop or select their own material, or they also have districts that develop or select material for them. So over 90% of teachers did say this for math. Um, the highest um, percentages of teachers that selected a published text selected Engage New York as the text that they rely on most for their instruction. This is pretty surprising to us, given that Engage New York has not been around as long as many of these other texts, and suggests that there's some appeal to open that um, teachers are seeking those materials out. Um, in addition, um, teachers at the secondary level, of course, reported using different resources than elementary teachers. These resources are either specifically for elementary or middle or secondary teachers, so that's no surprise. The average number of materials that mathematics teachers reported using for their instruction was about three published texts on average. Um, now, for English language arts, by contrast, the average number of materials that teachers report using is seven. And so they probably rely on a great many of different resources for their instruction compared to math teachers. English language arts teachers also say that they rely on materials they've developed or selected themselves as well as ones developed or selected by their districts. They also report in very high percentages um, using leveled readers or texts. And as I mentioned before, the extent to which teachers should be relying on these is not really made explicit in the Common Core, although the Common Core really emphasizes use of grade level texts. So a lot of use of leveled readers. In a minute, I'll show you some sli a slide where we attempt to try to understand how they're using leveled readers a little bit more. Um, accelerated Reader, Reading AZ, um, RAS Kids, these are also curricula with leveled reader components. So it suggests that there is a lot of use of leveled readers. Interestingly, teachers in those um, higher poverty schools report using leveled readers more. For example, about half of teachers in high poverty schools, as we've defined it, say that they use leveled readers on um, a daily or almost daily basis compared to one third of those in lower poverty schools. So there's a big difference there, suggesting that teachers in these higher poverty schools are really relying on these for their struggling readers. Unsurprisingly, they, pro they probably have a much higher percentage of struggling readers and so are using leveled readers more. So you saw before that over 90% of teachers say that they um, use materials they've developed or selected themselves. So we asked these teachers, well, what materials are you developing or selecting yourself? And this figure here demonstrates that compared to elementary teachers, more secondary teachers report developing or selecting instructional materials for a range of different reasons, for lesson plans, for problems or questions, especially for assessments, for unit or lesson objectives. So at the secondary level in particular, you see a lot more reliance on a range of um, materials that they develop or select on their own. Also to that leveled reader question again. We ask teachers to estimate the percentage of time that their students spend reading the same text written at the grade level, in class and outside of class, and what percent of time students read different texts depending on their reading level in class and outside of class. And you can see here in general that elementary teachers tend 
to report less that their students, lower percentages of time that their students spend reading the same text and higher percentages of time reading different texts depending on their love, reading level. So the majority of, of, of students' reading time is spent in elementary school reading different texts depending on their, on their reading level. Now what opportunities do teachers' main materials provide to address standards? So we asked this question of teachers' one top published material that they rely on. So for that one top published material we asked, tell us the extent to which this material gives you the opportunity to address various aspects of standards. So for mathematics, we asked a range of questions about the standards for mathematical practice and the extent to which your main materials give students opportunities to address those standards for mathematical practice. And you can see here about half of teachers say that um, their main materials address a range of these standards for mathematical practice. Yes, my materials use mathematical language and symbols appropriately, explain and justify their work. Um, these materials help students look for and make use of structure. Only a quarter of teachers said that their main materials help students construct viable arguments and critique the reasoning of others. So that was definitely lower on, on the spectrum in comparison to other standards for mathematical practice. We saw no differences for this particular question for teachers in higher and lower poverty schools. Um, we also asked the extent to which their materials um, help them focus on the instructional shifts that are associated with standards. And almost a lot of teachers, over three quarters of teachers, said that their main materials help them teach the major math topics addressed by the state mathematical standards for my grade level. Less so did teachers say that their main materials help them teach major math topics coherently or in the level or sequence recommended. And only about a third of teachers said that their main mat materials address three aspects of rigor with equal time and intensity. You may be asking what that means. Um, three aspects of rigor that are emphasized by standards include teaching for conceptual understanding, teaching procedural skill and fluency, and teaching application to real world um, situations. And teachers appear less so to think that their, that their instructional materials address those aspects of rigor and with equal time and intensity compared to other pieces of the instructional shifts. We also asked the same set of questions for English language arts standards practices. And again, we saw about half of teachers a little more saying that their main instructional materials help them use evidence from a text to make inferences or supporting conclusions. Their main instructional materials help students read fiction and nonfiction texts of sufficient grade level complexity. But the percentages go down when we ask about writing tasks and the extent to which their main materials do focus on writing. Lastly, um, a, a, little, a little bit about Louisiana. And we're hoping to write a report that specifically focuses on Louisiana based on our American teacher panel data and um, looks at that data alongside some state policies and practices to try to understand whether there is a connection between these state policies and practices and what our findings. And I'm anxious to hear John's perspective on that as well. Um, so these are just a few differences that we saw. When we asked teachers about their use of online materials, we saw in Louisiana much higher percentages, significantly higher percentages, saying that they consult their State Department of Education website, um, higher percentages um, seeking course standards, teachingchannel.org, learnzillion.org. And this in itself, you know, it's hard to know um, the, the extent to which they're seeking out these resources because they've been encouraged to by their state or for a lot of other reasons, but it does seem like teachers in Louisiana are seeking out a lot of these online resources more than other teachers. Um, one interesting statistic, about a quarter of Louisiana teachers consult their state Department of Education website at least once a week, compared to about 10% of those in other states. So that's definitely something that interests us. Um, also looking at comparisons between Louisiana and other teachers in regard to math materials, um, unsurprisingly because um, they, they do focus a lot on Engage New York as being, Eureka Math as being really aligned with their standards and Eureka Math is one of the curricula that's featured in Engage New York. But we see Louisiana teachers reporting that they use Engage New York in much higher percentages. 
They also report using Glencoe Math, Algebra 1, Pearson Prentice Hall, and Go Math in larger percentages than teachers in other states. I'm just showing you the, the percentages of teachers in Louisiana for the highest reported instructional materials. So you can see these differences. Now, Glencoe Math and Go Math, they've also been reviewed on the Louisiana website and are classified as third tier, so not as high quality as Eureka Math. So there's some use of these resources that is not necessarily aligned with what the state would maybe like teachers to be using. Um, for English language arts, we also saw a few differences. For example, um, accelerated reader, higher percentages of Louisiana teachers using that, as well as engaged New York materials, again, came up here. One other interesting comparison for us. We asked teachers in Louisiana the extent to which they're relying on leveled readers. Um, so percent of time students read different texts depending on their reading level, and the percent of time students read the same text written at grade level. And we see here, interestingly, that teachers in Louisiana, higher percentages tend to report that their students are spending more time reading the same text written at their grade level and less time reading different texts depending on their reading level. And this is just elementary. Um, for secondary, we didn't see any differences between um, Louisiana teachers and other teachers, but we thought this was a pretty interesting chart, suggesting that something may be happening there, encouraging teachers to use more um, grade level texts. So uh, we, we have found some other differences between Louisiana teachers and other teachers and practices and teachers' understanding about their standards, and we're hoping to get into those in more detail in a report towards the end of the summer. Now, some key takeaways on instructional materials from all of these findings, looking across all of them. Um, first, standards and district requirements seem to be connected more closely with teachers' use of math materials compared to use of ELA materials. In addition, secondary teachers, and particularly English language arts secondary teachers, um, create more of their own materials and rely less on required texts than elementary teachers. Teachers in high poverty schools are particularly seeking more online materials along with the Common Core, as well as a wide variety of other materials. Um, teachers' current main materials appear at least helpful for students writing, um, construction of viable arguments and critiquing the reasoning of others, and equal time and intensity on all aspects of mathematical rigor. And Louisiana teachers are seeming to engage in some material use that is different from those in other SAC states particularly in regard to use of engaged New York and leveled readers. What are some implications? Um, I'm hoping we can have a rich discussion about this, but some of the implications that we, we pulled out of this are that states and districts should consider how they can better select, develop, and curate instructional materials that help all teachers um, across schools address state standards with particular attention to English language arts materials that support student writing and help struggling readers grapple with grade level texts mathematics materials that support students' construction of viable arguments and help them engage in the three aspects of rigor that we talked about, and then materials to support secondary teachers' engagement in standards-based practices. And then additionally, um, we think that policymakers and researchers should keep examining how these state and district policies can best support teachers' use of standards-aligned, high-quality instructional materials. How can states and districts do this in a way that encourages teachers to use instructional materials that are well aligned with their state standards and help them with their instruction? So uh, just a brief note on next steps for us. We um, have a survey in the field right now that asks some similar questions to past surveys. Um, including use of instructional materials, and um, we're going to hope to report on those findings in the coming year, um, and then we're going to survey them once more in the, in the following spring so that we can track changes over time, hopefully. Um, we're also doing case studies. As I mentioned, we're hoping to write a report about Louisiana, and we're going to be talking to teachers and interviewing teachers so we can get some more rich data on their implementation of standards. That's it for me. Thank you, Julia. Yeah. Before I turn it over to, to John and actually Ashley to talk about what they're doing in their um, respective places, I just wanted to hear from Ashley as the one teacher on the panel today. Like, what do you what do you sort of make of those findings? How does that compare with your own experience, both before DC started doing what they've done around curriculum and uh, and and now? I find the findings very interesting. I know when I started um, teaching, DCPS did not have. Um, curricular materials as strong as they are now. Um, we really heavily relied on the scope and sequence to kind of drive what we were to teach and when. 
And now I'm very glad that we have moved towards having more resources for teachers, such as modules, um, lesson modules, and novel guides to really drive instruction. And um, one of the biggest points or the highlights of those materials would be the questioning technique. So as I look at the data, I wonder um, why teachers are moving toward you know, finding their own materials or creating their own materials. And I can conclude that maybe the strength of the questions or the strength of the, um, the text that are being used in those curricular documents are being questioned by, um, by the teachers. And I think maybe teachers are seeking um, a new approach to teaching, which speaks a lot about maybe their professional development that is being done in those particular districts. So I'm very happy to say that DCPS has really moved toward uh, using these curricular documents to not only drive instruction, but to also um, just talk about what curriculum should look like in schools and how students should be moving toward a progression in thinking and writing through um, the lessons that are being taught in the classrooms. Well, thanks. John, do you want to spend a little bit of time? Obviously, you see the results here in the RAND study, but can you spend a little bit of time talking about exactly what Louisiana has, has done and, and why it is you may have gotten those results that RAND found? Yeah, sure. I will say, I, I want to echo what Ashley says, that we've been watching from afar what uh, DC has been doing, and <laughs> Chancellor Henderson and Jason Cameras and, and others who've been, seem to have made this shift several years ago, and I think the quality of materials that are being produced, not just adopted in, in Washington, is really, really high quality and is great to see. Um, you know, I'll just start by saying that underneath all of this, for whatever positives you, know, you take from this regarding Louisiana, uh, I see a lot of chaos there that I know everyone else in the room sees. And what, uh, as Mike, you mentioned at the outset, what an incredible tragedy chaos in the classroom is, how I, I see how unnecessary it is and how solvable it is. And uh, you know, given all of the challenges that we face with uh, the labor market for teaching and the uh, uh, drag of inequality on the, on the classrooms of our, of our country, this one seems eminently solvable. And so I'm glad that we're here to discuss it. Teachers deserve a coherent curriculum. It makes for better teaching in the first place. And kids deserve a better experience in the classroom. So I'm glad that we're doing it. There are three sides to this that I think from a state perspective, and it is a different ball game. If every district were doing what DC did and had the talent to do what DC does and the resources and the drive and the courage, it'd be, we'd be in a different place. But the state does play an important role. And to the local control issues that Mike was playing, it's kind of a question of, well, what is that role? What capacity do states have? How are they positioned to do the work in the first place? And um, what are the forces working against it? Part of it, I think, as Julia mentions, is just about information. And not, you know, everything we saw up there is largely about information. What information is available? And how are teachers uh, accessing it? And how are they using it? And I don't think we would, I think we'd all be uh, lying if we said that the information that teachers get today, whether it's coming through huge search engines or whether it's coming from their state, is coherent, adequate, accurate, and so on. And it is true that a state can step in. And I think without probably breaching any tradition of local control, can at least provide information in a way that is coherent, in a way that is accurate, and in a way that is compelling. Uh, I think our state has done well at that. We're going to continue to do more. We shouldn't just stop at what is quintessentially called curriculum. We should be reviewing formative assessment, because the market of formative assessment is beyond underdeveloped and shameful. We should be reviewing the marketplace for professional development providers. Um, and we are doing both of those things as well. So you can take the information providing concept to a much uh, kind of longer term objective. But there are two other dimensions to it also. We have 70 school systems and 150 LEAs. Most states have many more than that. And so there's a question then of how is your state positioned to lead on the issue too, if it is at all. You know, you talked, Mike, earlier about California. We obviously are in a much different scope uh, scale and governance situation from California. Uh, and so there's a question of not just how do you access and, and create information, but how do you work at every single level given whatever leverage and instruments a state has in that specific state 
to get that information in the hands of consumers. And you know, we could talk for hours about that, but that's everything from social media and marketing all the way down to just the very most basic thing, which is get 5,000 teachers in a room and talk to them about it. I do think that, frankly, I'm, I'm in a way less concerned about state's ability to ultimately access information. I have a feeling the people in this room that state curriculum leads and others will find a way ultimately to get good information in people's hands or to develop it. What I'm more concerned about is how do you compel people through all the layers of bureaucracy and governance to actually get to a point of adoption? And there are, we should talk about this, a million things that states should be doing to create a coherent framework for teachers. And if there's one thing on there that I'm actually most proud of, it's not so much the Engage New York or Eureka adoption, which um, if you really, really work with people, in my view, they come to understand why that's so important. It's actually more the level text that you talked about, which is so much less about handing something that's packaged and about a mindset, which as an English teacher, and I'm, I hope that Ashley shares my opinion, uh, is couldn't be more of a, of a sea change in the mindsets of many people who have been uh, reared on a very traditional framework. Uh, so I'm very, very proud of that. However, it does come with a third pillar, and that is politics. And this is a discussion that uh, we have to put this square on the table. And that is that even as of last week, we were battling a last minute conference committee report in the back room of a state legislature that nobody in this room other than me spends any time thinking about. State legislatures <laughs> and state boards of education are way, way off the grid, but they make seismic decisions about what kids do and learn every day. And the fact of it is publishers of both tests and publishers of more quintessential curricula work it. And largely, reform organizations don't. We work it at the national level, but we don't work curriculum like we work labor, like we work choice at the local level. And that has to change, too. People uh, who are in positions like mine don't largely have the backing of a strong reform push or even the reform backing when the fight comes with publishers who have money to make and who are, frankly, have been in many cases, not in all, thank God, but in many, relentless about an unwillingness to change and a desire for maximizing profits on old materials that are not helping students, and that needs to be said. I was actually going to ask you, and I think maybe you answered the question about what, what's it going to take for the marketplace to really change? I mean, Louisiana really sort of stands alone in terms of states that have done, really sort of taken on this responsibility in a, in a really big way. Will it take more states doing what Louisiana's done? Will it, will it take more local jurisdictions to just say no to purchasing? Like, what is it going to take for the marketplace to sort of create and provide massive amounts of material so that teachers aren't having to find the quality on their own? What do, you, what do you think? I think it's kind of all, all of the above strategy. I mean, you know, we're sitting here as government officials. It would, be, it, it's, it would be a mistake on one hand to say that government doesn't play a big role in this. It does. Um, I don't think most states are as intently focused on how do I get this information into the hands of teachers and how do I compel them and administrators in those districts to, to change. I do think states can be doing more. But as with the implementation of the federal law, we would all have our heads in the sands if we didn't acknowledge that states largely uh, have not succeeded at implementations of this level of sophistication uh, in a variety of kinds in recent years. And so to put it all on states would be a mistake. We talked about ed reports, and I do think that the uh, nonprofit sector within the policy community has a big, big role to play and could play an increasing role. I think that reform organizations, Achieve included, play a huge role in this. And, and more than anything else, that should trickle down through unions and professional associations. It should be a prerogative of anyone who is concerned with the future of schooling in America that we give teachers the materials they need to do their jobs appropriately. And the good news is, on that aspect of it, the politics couldn't be better. There's nothing that teachers know is true more than that they are not given adequate resources to effectively do their jobs. And in a day and age when it has largely been accepted I think for, for good reason, that student outcomes at least should play some role in the accountability of educators. Giving them the tools necessary to do their jobs is not a difficult thing to sell them on. It's just difficult to do and difficult to compel the publishers, the politicians, and the bureaucrats to get out of the way. I think one of the things that Louisiana did, the DC also did, and Ashley, I'm hoping you'll tell everyone a little bit more about the DC story, but, and also this aspect to it. There's a coherence to what you did, and Julia's survey really points this out, that 
that it wasn't just reviewing materials and making that available on the website, it was making sure that professional development um, reinforced those findings, that people had access and knew um, what the good material looked like, where to find it, how it fit with what they were doing. So Ashley, tell us a little bit more about how those pieces all fit together in DC and, and what DC's been doing for the past five years. Sure, so um, maybe about five years ago, um, we collectively got a group of teachers together to start developing some curricular materials and it started with creating um, lesson modules and it was a great professional development opportunity for me and for the other teachers that were working alongside of um, other school leaders and instruction coaches to develop um, really thoughtful and careful lesson plans for students. And since then, we have expanded to um, include other, um, other subjects. So we have um, math and we have social studies and we have um, music departments and we have, you know, from every discipline we are coming together um, mainly during the summer months to create these materials and to review and to tweak them as needed. Um, so since then we've also um, been working parallel with um, the professional development. So much of our professional development is based on these curricular documents so that teachers are not only getting the support that they need to implement these plans in their classrooms, but also um, it's an opportunity to engage in some dialogue, get some feedback, and really become critical consumers of the work that we've been producing. So um, being on that team was a great professional development opportunity for me, and I'm really excited because now more teachers will have an opportunity to engage in that professional development. It's great to have materials, but it's um, even more great to have teachers who who know how to develop their own quality materials in the classroom. Thanks, Ashley. Tell us a little bit about what role do you think that teacher engagement played in, in teachers sort of accepting and the buy-in that DC has had around those materials? Yeah, so when the teachers created the materials, we were also um, given an opportunity to lead the professional development. So the teachers who were using the materials were able to have a face-to-face -face conversation with the persons who created the documents that they were using in their classrooms. So it opened up um, an opportunity to foster relationships and to collaborate amongst other teachers in the district um, to get a sense of what was going on in classrooms, um, which was really powerful because now we can have authentic conversations about what schools um, and what teachers were doing in different classrooms across the district, right? And we can also focus on making sure that each student is getting an equitable um, education in each school in a district. Um, so it was very, um, it was very important that we um, not only had the curriculum, but also used the curriculum to drive what was being taught at the PD. Thanks. Um, I think we're going to open it up for questions, so get ready with your questions. Is I think Claudia is going to be our mic runner, so just raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question and be sure to um, identify yourself and, and then ask the question. And as you're thinking of your questions, I'll, I'll just ask one more. I think a lot of people have mentioned it's a you know, completely unrealistic and Herculean task to think that teachers you know, are going to be experts in pedagogy, that they're going to um, uh, both create um, and design their own curriculum and then deliver that curriculum and, oh, make sure it's differentiated too, right? Like that seems to be, and to John's point, like an impossible task. So what is the most important thing that we can do um, as a community to both create better materials and also to make sure that teachers are really discerning consumers of those materials. And I'll start with Julia and then we'll work our way down, at which point Claudia will <laughs> start calling on people. Go wow, Julia. that's a really great question. Uh, you know, and it, I, I think that what John said about compel, how do you compel teachers to use these materials is, is the right question. And I think teachers are just day by day making sense of their environment and trying to figure out what to do based on their PD, trying to figure out what to do based on their assessments, trying to figure out what to do based on their standards and all these things, if they're not aligned, they're not going to, they're not going to take them to the same place with materials. And so if you can kind of create this environment that's more, I've heard this word coherent, 
across a, a number of your different comments. And I think if you can create this place where it is coherent, and then you involve them in the process, that the choice of what to use makes the most sense to them. I don't think, you know, to give information, John, as you said, is not enough. How do you compel teachers to use it? And I think it's about them making sense of it and it being the most rational choice to use these materials is the thing to figure out how to do. Well, district curriculum can land anywhere between um, a lesson plan to a scripted you know, unit plan or a scripted coursework, right? Um, but I think teachers are looking for some flexibility. I think teachers are looking for materials that are inclusive of all the students in their classrooms so that they can use the material and they know that each student is going to move toward that critical thinking. Um, so I think the biggest piece, I think, for me is when I look for curricular documents, I'm looking for the questioning techniques and whether or not um, that helps students to move from an inferential, excuse me, a basic level to an inferential understanding of the text, right? So I think when you make them very flexible and the questioning is very effective, that will help teachers to um, really get on board with using those curricular documents. Yeah, I agree with everything that's been said. I, I guess I would take it maybe up a, a little level and just say that I think this is a leadership crisis, and um, or this is a breakdown, a systemic breakdown in leadership. And so the question I think largely is for anyone who is concerned with nationwide education policies, state by state, district by district, how can you best repair this leadership problem? And you know, we're going into a process, all of us, the District of Columbia, Louisiana, and others, where we're going to be outlining for the federal government and for the rest of the country our systems, essentially. And I do think that if you're concerned with uh, that actually having a positive outcome for kids, especially disadvantaged kids, it's incumbent upon all of us not just to ask the question of, well, how stringent is your accountability system? How comparable are your measurement instruments? But also, where in there do, does your approach to curriculum, your approach to remediation, and your approach to professional development and training actually give teachers and kids a chance of achieving those measures in the first place? And I do worry that as we go into ESSA, as, as, hope, as hawkish as I hope will be on accountability, that we won't use the moment that the Common Core, thanks so much to Achieve and others, has given us to actually talk about what teachers and kids deserve, which is a coherent curriculum and to make it a reform issue. And so for all of you who are kind of looking over states' shoulders over the next couple of years, I would really urge you to say curriculum has to be on the table, not as a matter of federal decision or a matter of federal oversight, not even as a matter of state decision making, but as a matter of if you're not thinking, talking, and writing about it in your plan, what is your approach? Then clearly you're missing a big piece of the equation. Well, I would say before Mike goes, the, the fact that each one of you mentioned coherence, that doesn't happen by accident. That requires leadership, right? Whether it's at the state or the local level, absolutely critical. So Mike? I want to say two things picking up on, 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 on uh, previous comments. One is, I think, one way into so this issue of how do you compel teachers to pay attention to the information, I think is a real one. And I don't think we want to compel teachers on the basis of higher authority. I think we want to engage teachers mm -hmm. In, in, in wrestling with the issue themselves. I think one pathway into that, and we've seen this with some of our work in EQUIP, right, is helping teachers look at and talk about the work that they assign students to do, right? Are the questions they're asking, are the assignments that they're giving actually eliciting evidence from students as to the extent to which they actually meet the standards? And I think that's that's an area I know there's a lot of interest among teachers in talking uh, with each other about that, and I think we've got to figure out a way to be as supportive as possible uh, in that space because that will compel them to look at the instructional materials issues from a lens that has some real immediacy and practical value to them. That's one. Secondly, um, from a larger leadership point of view, we've been talking here uh, about these instructional materials and curricular issues around Common Core. Achieve also is working on the same issues in science, which is about three years behind the Common Core, at least started right three years later. And so we've been trying to figure out how do we avoid in science right, what we've now experienced and discussed in uh, math and ELA. And we see both a smart demand side 
to the strategy, which has to do with getting more states to do what Louisiana did and actually do rigorous, thoughtful reviews of materials and provide that information to educators. Um, um, training the folks who are involved in both selection and procurement issues at the state and local level, right? Giving them the tools and the support they need to make wise judgments. But there's also a bottom-up capacity, bottom-up effort to this because there are so many materials that come in to the classroom, not through the state house, not through the district, but through, through uh, the internet, that we really need a way to help teachers become more discerning consumers in a way that doesn't right, overly tax the limited amount of time that they've got. So there's a smart demand side. There's also a smart supply side, which has to do with finding districts and states that are developing their own material and helping them do a better job at that than they might otherwise and make that information as widely available as possible. Uh, in, in Achieve, we're talking about, um, uh, at least um, uh, conceptually, about an Engage NGSS, Next Generation Science Standards, because we discovered in our own work that Engage New York is actually, would more aptly be called Engage America, because it is used all over the place. And how do we find those great materials that are being developed at the state and local level and make them widely, widely available? So all of that, I think, is part of a leadership challenge that we at Achieve feel uh, we've got to step up to, and we'll continue to try to work in this space. Great. Okay, let's open it up for questions. Hi, I'm Jay Diskey with the Association of American Publishers. Hey, Mike. Uh, just one thing that, and more of a comment, and, and I have a lot of them. And, well, first of all, thank you for this briefing. It really, uh, one thing that has surprised me in my 10 years in this job is how little focus there has been on curriculum reform. We're starting to see more and more of it, which uh, from my point of view is, is a very good thing. I would like uh, the panel's just reaction on one real quick and simple thing, which is involving teachers in the selection process. Uh, many states and districts don't have that sort of teacher voice in it. Uh, products are often purchased or selected and then put in the classroom, as Julia mentioned, with very little professional development, less than a day. Uh, John is from an adoption state where teachers are involved in uh, selecting materials, but there's not, not too many adoption states anymore. There's only 18 officially by statute. I think when teachers are involved in actually selecting particularly the major tools, uh, you get more coherence eventually. So, Thank any you. thoughts on that? Couldn't agree more. I mean, and, and frankly, you know, when you talk about the best professional development, it's this, it is the, the, we call it a review process or the, or the adoption process if it's, process it's, if it's well done. And, and you know, one thing that we're, we're talking here about how to give teachers the capacity to make smart choices, then you know, beyond that, in, in our experience certainly, it's actually using high quality curriculum as the best means of building the capacity within teachers to make smart choices subsequently about materials. So I agree with you that it's important and it's the, the, the teachers are the most knowledgeable and sophisticated are the ones who have gone through that process themselves. Joan, can I just ask how many, the teachers that are involved um, in, are there teachers involved in reviewing the curriculum, the ones that you post online, are those teacher yes. reviewed? Those are all teacher led, yeah. And how many teachers are involved in that process in Louisiana? We have, I, I mean, it's in the hundreds, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, uh, wow. We have a structure where we have 5,000 teacher leaders that some of, some of you uh, have been good enough to come down and. And, and see. So we have three to four teachers per school in the state, all of which kind of play a lead curriculum role. And then there are teacher leader advisors, which is several hundred of them that are kind of the team captains that um, have taken charge of both reviewing curricula as well as uh, where there are gaps, having to step in and create curriculum solutions as well. I do think that's an important thing to note, by the way, on all of this. We're talking about reviewing and selecting curricula as if they're just simply are some good ones and some bad ones. The reality is there are plenty of, of uh, tools that simply don't exist for teachers. And still today, I would largely say, and I'd be interested in Ashley's perspective, but as an English teacher, if you are, have been directed by the standards toward novels and other primary texts, we still don't see a robust market of supplemental guidance for teachers to create frameworks absent district-created materials like what DCPS has done. We've stepped in with LearnZillion and uh, have developed an open resource ourselves. But uh, you know, 
that was teacher-led. Mm -hmm. But there are things that the that states and teachers themselves are having to do, districts, because they simply don't exist in the published world, not because there's good ones and bad ones. Can I ask a, anybody else have an answer to Jay's question? And, and maybe as part of that, I'm just curious about what the interaction has been with, with the two of you in particular um, with publishers and what you're hearing from publishers. And, and is, there, is there increased pressure on publishers to, to provide more of the materials that, that, um, that are needed? Are we, see, are we seeing any changes in the marketplace? I'll, I'll say this. Um, I, we have extremely willing partners in an openness to being reviewed. And, and I think there are plenty of market incentives for that, but we've not met many major or small publishers that aren't, industry, aren't interested in being reviewed. Secondly, I would say that, that uh, people who advocated at, maybe earlier on in the Common Core effort that this would create a marketplace for small actors mm -hmm. to play in a uh, potentially a, a fairer and more transparent market, I actually experienced that very much to be true. Maybe not true enough across the country for all the reasons we're talking about, but I feel like our interactions with small publishers have oftentimes yielded great results at scale and real, and real quality. Uh, anything I have negative to say about publishers is not at all to say writ large that the publishing industry should have blame placed on their shoulders uh, for any of the statistics we saw earlier. But I do think it's important to acknowledge that as in probably every other private profit mode of industry, there is somewhat of a tendency at times to try to uh, address uh, one's position in the market by way of politics and lobbying rather than by way of adjusting the materials themselves. And I don't say that to indict anybody or demean anyone. That probably is just a natural fact of doing business in states. But it is to say that this is a political game. It is one that is worth tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars a year in a given state. And uh, it's a high stakes thing. And that means if you're going to really, really make change, you're going to have to acknowledge that for a lot of people, their livelihoods are at stake, not just their well wishes for children. And that means a, probably a harder line political message, frankly, from the reform community on the issue of if you're going to play in the state, you're going to have to come to the table with quality. And a lot of the lobbying shenanigans that I think experience, are experienced in most state houses really need to end. I just want to build on that for, for a second, John, because I think, I think you're right. I don't, I don't think there's been enough attention uh, in the last four or five years either to understanding what's driving publishers. I have to confess, I'm one of those who thought 45 plus states adopt the same standards. Surely that will have a significant impact in the marketplace and we should see the results anytime soon. So I'm actually, uh, Jay, I'll be visiting you soon. I'd like to understand what, like, from your point of view, what does the world look like, right, from the publisher's point of view, given the huge shift in to, to common, uh, common standards. But the other thing that we haven't done well, and you pointed this out before, is pay attention to the folks who are actually making the decisions. And it's, sometimes it's a textbook, you know, adoption committee or review committee, but sometimes it's the state board and state legislature. And I think we haven't done enough Help, help folks in those positions understand how they need to be thinking about those issues and those decisions and what's really at, at stake. So I think we've got a lot of work to do on that. Yeah. Um, my name's Leanna Height and I'm with Education Week. Um, I have a question for the superintendent. Um, so I know, you know, you talked about it just briefly about the curriculum that the, you all have developed in the state. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, a little bit about how that process and how you know that that what's been developed in the state is better than than what's out there. Um, when you have materials like Engage New York, you know, what what makes what you all have done better? Um, and also, is this? Do you foresee other states doing what you all have done and creating a curriculum of their own? You know, OER materials of their own. Is that th something you foresee happening? Do you think other states should be doing that? Just want to hear your thoughts on that. Well, we're going to put it through our review process on the first, to the first question, and we'll see. That's number one. Secondly, I, I do think that we have to translate a lot of the research that Rand has done in this general line of thinking you're hearing today to actually start talking about results. That's hard in when there is still such a kind of dissonant discussion about whether the NAEP fairly and truly measures you know, largely the effort that we're up here discussing, and I hope that that's something that we can continue to talk about more. But I really, really hope that we're able over time 
to trace actual impact uh, at scale on student outcomes to very specific curriculum decisions that big districts like DC or states like Louisiana uh, have made. I don't think that states developing their own curricula is the, is the solution. And in the case that, that I described, Learn Zillion sought us as a partner and we worked specifically with a publisher that I think has done fantastic work to develop as a beta site an open education resource that's available to any state in the country. I pointed it out though because it is a pretty stunning thing that given the shift toward primary resources and novel sets that there doesn't exist a, I don't think, enough of a coherent framework, especially for secondary English teachers, to take that framework of I'm moving away from my textbook, my package textbook, and I'm moving toward novel sets, but here's how I translate that into greater gains, better tasks, and a long-term, year-long framework for instruction, that that doesn't exist in the marketplace, either through an open or through a procured resource, is really a problem. And I'm thankful to Learn Zillion that they stepped in and did it. I think the private sector, the private, the market will come around to these challenges, but sometimes it does take the state or a district to say, we need this. And by the way, as, as Mike and others at Achieve could certainly tell you, that's not limited to curricula in the way they're referring to it today. It's very much true of testing as well. We're talking a lot as a state, as a country, about uh, reducing tests, but we have stopped talking enough about the quality of tests, and both quality curriculum and quality assessment and really quality professional development are things that it is within the power of consumers to say, we have these specifications, just like on a house or a car. These are our specifications. And largely, it's in those areas as well as in curriculum that states and districts aren't doing enough of that. Any reaction, Ashley? Yeah, I just wanted to touch on a point about student outcomes because we know that that's the bottom line, right? And I wanted to echo the idea that, you know, what makes it better is the fact that um, as far as DC curriculum goes is that teachers are leading this force, right? And we know our kids. So when you take a look at student outcomes, because we know our kids, we know uh, what they need to know, we know where they are now, we have that insight information that so many other um, persons may not have that are looking from the outside in. Other questions? Hi, I'm Lisa Hansel with a new effort called Knowledge Matters, and um, this is wonderful. It's very rare for those of us who are strongly in favor of a knowledge-rich, well-rounded education, especially at the elementary grades, to, um, to hear a panel like this, and particularly hear the word coherent come up over and over again. <laughs> um, so thanks. This is a wonderful start to my week. Uh, but uh, so I wanted to ask specifically a couple of um, questions. One, uh, which you were just mentioning about assessment. And um, I think this is particularly important when we look at reading comprehension tests. And um, you know, psychometricians know that they are assessing essentially vocabulary breadth of knowledge as well as some you know, fluent decoding skills. Uh, but I, just anecdotally, and I'd love to, you know, maybe the teacher panel could resolve this at some point, but anecdotally it seems that most teachers think that the reading comprehension assessments are assessing strategies, find the main idea, make a prediction, that sort of thing. And um, superficially, that's what the questions are, but ultimately, it's that knowledge base driving the ability to answer the questions. So my first question is, um, when you're talking about curriculum and assessment, is there an opportunity here to rethink how we go about our assessments and to actually have assessments tied to curricula? Uh, and then we can, you know, there are all sorts of ways to equate uh, student results, so we wouldn't have to lose out on some commonality of being able to do comparative work. Uh, and then the other quick thing is just how could we um, sort of support more districts, incentivize more districts uh, to essentially follow in the footsteps of DCPS and, and some of the other places that are doing high quality, well-rounded curricula, um, particularly looking at a shared curriculum across schools because we do have a lot of highly mobile students, not to mention teachers, and it's a very basic step we could take to minimize the disruption for kids' education when they change schools if we were to look at um, not necessarily all content being shared, but you know some 
core of material that is taught across schools, across grade levels, um, at least within a district. So um, that's a lot to tackle, but thank you very much. <laughs> I've got at least one, one answer to your, to your question about assessment and a rich knowledge-based curriculum. This is it's just all anecdotal, but I can remember just a couple of months ago, a group of us uh, from Achieve were out in California meeting with their early implementer districts for the science standards. And one of the things we heard, I think one of the assistant superintendents say was something to the effect, well, praised um, uh, the smarter balanced assessment that had just been given because the literacy, um, the, 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 the literacy test at the elementary grades asks questions about science. And she said, you know, we need more of those because that's what's going to drive it, it, attention to science in the early grades when for such a long time, right, it's all been about reading strategies and, 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 and math. So I do think that the design of the assessments matters. Now, just having science is a step, but but having good content-based questions are important, which would probably lead or ought to lead to a conversation about what would an integrated curriculum in the early grades look like. So you're building a, a rich knowledge base for students, and not just in science, but in social studies and the arts, et cetera. That's what students need in the early grades, and we need to make that a priority. I just, maybe to both of your questions, I, I think um, kind of yes to all of everything that you said, uh, I think, as I, insofar as I recall it. But, but, uh, 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 but I, I, you know, as, as you know, core knowledge in Louisiana is a tier one curriculum. That's our only tier one literacy curriculum. The skills strand is in the primary grades. Um, I just two quick observations about how that then links to an assessment, and we've uh, uh, certainly shared these discussions in different forums. Um, no question that uh, pre-K through two or early childhood to two assessment has been a largely, I think, undiscussed matter over the last several years and is uh, badly in need of a kind of clean the closet out approach. And uh, the question then is, when you, if you have a content-rich curriculum and you're advocating its usage, you don't see the marketplace, frankly, really responding, uh, and you see a lot of clutter teachers in need of some guidance, decades of backlogged laws that require specific types of assessments, which is not uncommon in states. Uh, how do you clean out the closet, and at what level? Is it at the Louisiana level, the DCPS level, or the schoolhouse level? Does the leadership need to be shown to put the right instruments into place? Um, I think some states, and I think ours, are probably well positioned to, to step up and help teachers play a leadership role. I don't think that's true everywhere. And so I think it's incumbent upon those of you who are in support or advocacy organizations to help states and big cities in particular find a way to get it done, whatever their governance structure is, whatever the legacy laws are, and whatever is current in place. But please do not, please don't apologize for advocating a clean the closet out approach, because I think many, many places, us included in the primary grades, need to start there. Any other feedback? No. All right, any other questions? Okay, I'll, um, I'll just ask the panelists for any closing thoughts that you might have. Strangely enough, I think this event is actually gonna end exactly on time. Um, <laughs> Julia, I'll start with you. I, I just um, wanna go back to this idea of coherence, and I think it, it relates to all of your, a lot of your questions, too. Um, I think to have um, a good curriculum be a coherent choice for teachers, you have to have all these ducks in a row and you have to clean out the closet. And um, it strikes me, I hope that in our, in our panel that we can try to get more good information over time on these changes, especially in places like Louisiana, so we can understand whether efforts like yours are, are making a difference for what teachers do. And I think you know, it's probably the case that over time, teachers' practices will change a little. And if we can capture that, I think that'll give us some more information about what works, too. Ashley? I'm really excited that we started the conversation today about curriculum, because it's often something that's thrown under the table or you know, not spoke about um, very often. Um, so I am very interested in seeing how what we have developed in DC and in Louisiana, how that will impact students, you know, 10 years from now. Yeah. 
I agree. I, I think you know what's happening in Washington. Um, there, the gains that they're seeing, sustained over such a period of time, you have to think that this is in large part about who's at the helm and who's in the classroom. But it's also largely about the way that they have focused and built the capacity of those people, including the curriculum choices that they're making. And I, seeing it from afar, I have no question that their turn toward not just the development of educator capacity, but the substance of what's taught in the classroom has a huge amount to do with their sustained gains. In our state, of our 20, we have 70 school systems, of our 20 most improved last year, 19 use a tier one curriculum mm -hmm. in both English and math. And um, when you realize that we only have three or four tier one curricula, that is an amazing thing That's, given yeah. what's available out there. It, it, you know, it, it really has a systemic role to play. And for those of you who are, look at the system. I agree with the coherence point. I agree with the quality point. I do think it's a question of finding our voice because the voice is largely contained in this room right now, I think. It needs to be much, much bigger and people in this room have the chance to make that happen. Thanks. As always, I'm gonna let Mike have the last word. Oh, thank you, Cindy. <laughs> Uh, just a couple of quick, quick observations, picking up on the theme of coherence, right, and some of the things I said at the outset about how important it is to have a coherent system of standards, curriculum, instructional materials and strategies, professional development and assessments. That package, right, is critical for improvement. I think that's just the story you, you've been, both of you have been telling in both Louisiana and, and DCPS are, are leading the effort in that. This is not easy work to do. It is substantively and technically challenging, right, to be able to pull off the kind of quality and curriculum that's needed, the quality and assessments that we've been able to see gains in, particularly from the two assessment consortia in recent years. It also takes leadership, right? This is a tough environment in which to work, and you've got to be able to sustain these efforts over a period of years, long years, in order for them to have the impact that we're hoping it will. So. Leadership from the top, but leadership at every level in the system, from teachers to local superintendents to chief state school officers and, and others. We need that leadership. We need people who've got the strength and the courage to basically fight a good fight here because that's what it's going to take to get the results that we need. So I think we're off to a start here. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Appreciate it.